Depending on the ecosystem service we're looking at, there are different approaches we can use to approximate their value. First, we're going to look at a market-based approach. The market-based approach can be used to approximate the value of environmental goods that are bought and sold on a market. So timber, fish, medicinal plants, water, animals, insects, nuts, fruits, and berries. Okay, goods that are traded. It can't be used for all those services like clean air, water purification, stunning views, biodiversity, and other things that aren't typically traded. But we'll look at those values in the coming videos. Measuring values this way is done by measuring the consumer and producer surplus. In theory, people will have this maximum willingness to pay for an item. That is our measure of value. They have to give something up to get it. The difference is the consumer surplus or the change in value the consumer feels they're getting. Everyone has a different willingness to pay and people are generally willing to pay less to get another of something. Their collective demand function will look something like this. Their collective willingness to pay is this area. This is the value the consumers get from the resource. If it was free, it would all be consumer surplus. If there's a cost, we have to subtract it. We talked about consumer surplus in a bit more depth in the intro to this series. But a part of the value gained from an ecosystem service may be producer surplus if someone is supplying it. Let's say a producer catches and sells fish. They're going to have costs in boat and equipment repair and purchase, buying fuel, paying workers and managers, taxes, and whatever else I can't think of. And they are going to earn revenue from the sale of fish. To the producer, this is all the value they had to give up to bring the good into market. And this is all the benefit they received from bringing it to market. The difference is the producer surplus. Let's say it costs more to catch additional fish. Workers get tired and work slower. Maybe the owner has to pay overtime pay and hire additional crew. They may have to fish in deeper water further from shore, fish all night. So the cost to bring an additional unit of fish to market becomes a little bit more expensive with each fish. If the money they would make is below what it would cost, they won't supply, at least in the long term. It's the same for all the producers, and their cumulative supply function might look something like this. This area is their costs, and this is their producer surplus. Consumer and producer surplus added together would give the total economic surplus. It's all the value the producers and consumers get from the goods, minus all the costs and work they had to put in. Let's say a pollutant threatens some fish habitat and it will decrease fish population. This here was the total economic surplus before the change, but the pollution is going to increase the costs of the suppliers who now have to put in more search costs to find the fish. This pushes the supply curve to the left. If there's less fish in market, it's going to make consumers fight over them, which makes the suppliers raise the price. To find out how the environmental change has affected people's value of the resource, we would find the change in total economic surplus from before and after the pollution. So far, we've been relying on the idea that we just know the shape of the demand curve and supply curve. For here, and for a lot of the methods we're going to be looking at, the game is trying to build these functions so we can estimate the surplus and the change in surplus. For the the demand curve, the ideal circumstance is have a bunch of different markets with identical consumers and producers, multiple universes. In each universe, set the price at a different amount. Then we could just see how much of the good is traded at different prices, and then we have the data to build the demand function. But we don't have multiple universes yet. Can we just plot the quantities sold and the prices from previous years? No, because it's not just the price it's set at that affects the quantity traded. We can't assume this is movement along the same demand curve. The amount traded is also affected by the price of substitute goods or complementary goods, consumer income, population, preferences, and probably some other stuff. And each year would probably have a different demand function. There are several ways to try to tease out the shape of the demand curve in the real world. One way is to do a market experiment. We don't have multiple universes, but a company could try to change the price in certain cities to try to determine how demand changes, assuming everything else is equal. That might work, but another way is to examine the data from past years. But instead of assuming the price is the only factor, we factor in all the other stuff that affects the shape of the demand curve. This is the world of regression analysis. We're not going to get into it much here, but the idea is if these are all the factors that affect the demand function, then by looking at the data for the past years for all this stuff, we can sort of reverse engineer the equation for what the demand curve is going to look like right now. There are some links in the description that can help with regression analysis if you're interested. The supply curve is going to be the amount of money it costs the fishing fleet to catch each additional pound or ton or netful or whatever unit we're talking about of fish. In practice, this is analyzing the costs of all the different fishermen at given levels of overall catch to build the supply curve. When analysts don't have time or money or data to estimate the shape of the demand curve, it's common to just multiply the price by the quantity, which would give an estimate of the total value of fish produced. Then from that, they subtract the production costs and it gives the net benefit of the fishery. And they just see 
see how this number changes with an environmental change. It's not a proper value measurement and we're completely ignoring the consumer surplus, but it's still a number that policymakers and people will understand. With limited resources, this can be better than nothing. And you'll see these kind of shortcuts all the time with environmental valuation. One example where they use the market-based approach was for the marine ecosystems of the Agulhas bioregion in South Africa. There are three marine protected areas in the region that were threatened by exploitation and pollution. Any increase in conservation efforts were met with resistance because money went in and didn't seem to come out. So a team did an economic assessment on the effects of the protected area on fishing, recreation, and the existence value. For fishing, they used a market-based approach. The idea is that fish have a safe place to spawn and grow and they will seed harvested populations outside. But the space the marine protected area takes up, takes up fishable area that the fishermen could have been using. Their strategy was to find out how many fish migrate out, find out how that affects the catch per unit effort for the fishermen, and then multiply their catch by the price of the fish. They weren't calculating the surplus. Also find the opportunity cost of not fishing that area. A number of studies had been done in the area regarding fish breeding and migration that the researchers drew their data from. But the research was a little bit weak. About a dozen species make up the majority of the catch, but they had to use information on just two of them to estimate what the rest were doing. And they had to take some other shortcuts. Not ideal, but it's the best they could do with what they had. Using a discount rate of 6%, they found the present costs and benefits to be this over a 20 year period. Here, there is no marine protected area, so there is no benefit from fishing migrating out of the area. This is the way it is right now. And this is a scenario with stricter rules and making one of the protected areas bigger. This is the opportunity cost of closing down a section of the ocean to fishing. Although it should be noted that this tends to be temporary. This graph shows the cumulative costs and benefits to fishermen assuming different levels of fish export in this area. At first, the fishermen do lose out, but as the fish are given time and space to grow, they will seed areas around the protected zone. In the end, even with an overestimation of the costs and a conservative estimate of the benefits, they found the benefits to outweigh the costs. In the next few videos, we're going to look at a few cost-based valuation methods for valuing ecosystem services.